Oh, hello everyone. I bet you didn't expect to hear from me again, did you? It's been uh, approximately four years since I released my last video here, and a couple of you have been wondering when I'd start this back up again, and it just hasn't happened until today. And I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to not prepare at all, and just make stuff up, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I've had some interest for a while in putting together some basic emulators and I did a little tiny bit of research and this is about as far as I've gotten but my tiny bit of research told me that I should start with something called Chip 8 and so that's what I'm gonna try to start today and we're not gonna make it all the way there because I'm probably not going to record for many hours but we'll make a part of the way there and hopefully learn a few things along the way so let's buckle up write some C-sharp code and have some fun so an emulator is something that emulates or simulates the uh, device that we're trying to replicate. And so in this case, we're trying to replicate something called the Chip 8 Virtual Machine. And this isn't, this isn't really typical of a standard emulator. You've probably heard of emulators in the context of things like the Nintendo or Super Nintendo or N64 or PlayStation, where we're emulating an actual machine and how that machine behaves. Chip 8 doesn't work that way because Chip 8 was never actually a machine. Chip 8 was a virtual machine that ran on other computers. And so we're going to be, I don't know if emulation is the correct word, but we're going to be creating a Chip 8 virtual machine today. And then hopefully, after we learn how that works, uh, we can make something a bit more complex. I would love to do something like a Game, Game Boy or uh, Nintendo or the Famicom, but we'll see if we get there. So here we're going to do a little bit of research. Chip 8 was a virtual machine. It's not a real piece of hardware. It ran on 1970s computers. And it's got a couple of instructions. It's got some registers and some memory. It's got a stack and some timers, input graphics and sounds. And so we're just going to try to build this thing. And we're going to try to build it in C Sharp because that's my uh, language du jour these days and has been for many years since all my previous videos were also done in C Sharp. So, where to start here? Let's read a little bit about it. It was implemented on 4K systems, including something called the Telmac 1800, which I've never heard of, but sounds cool. And these machines had four kilobytes of memory. Everything was eight bits. And the Chip 8 interpreter occupies the first 512 bytes of the memory space. So, uh, whoever wrote this virtual machine, it looks like the interpreter itself occupied that first little chunk of memory. Most programs written for the system begin at memory location 512 and do not access any of the memory below that. The uppermost 256 bytes is reserved for display refresh and the 96 bytes below that reserved for call stack. Let's see where it's running nearly outside the 4K memory space. There's no need for any of the lower 512 byte memory space to be used, but it's common to store font data. Cool. It's got 16 8-bit registers from V0 to VF. So uh, that's kind of cool. This is a hexadecimal uh, representation. So the V at the front there is just the name of the register. And then the second letter there, which is anything from 0 to F, is just a hex hexadecimal representation of 0 to 15. And so if you were writing this in decimal, it would just be V0 to V15, but they chose to use hexadecimal, so it's V0 to VF. The VF register is a fancy special purpose register that implements things like a carry flag when you're doing addition, no borrow flag during subtraction and in the draw collision or draw instruction it's pixel collision. That's cool. And then the address register is named I, 16 bits wide, so two bytes, and uh, is used for several opcodes. Cool. And then the stack. It stores the return addresses when subroutines are called. That's cool. Uh, allocate 48 bytes for up to 24 levels of nesting. Okay. Cool. And then it's got two timers, both count down at 60 hertz, and so uh, 60 times per second until they reach zero. There's a delay timer, and then there's a sound timer. So we're gonna have to figure out how to make beeping. It sounds like fun. Input is done with a hex keyboard with up to 16 keys between zero and F again. So again, that's a hexadecimal representation. Uh, three all codes used to detect input. And then graphics and sound, we've got a huge 64 by 32 pixel resolution and it's monochrome, so just black and white. Graphics are drawn to the screen by drawing sprites, which are eight pixels wide. Cool, and between one to 15 pixels high. 
spread pixels are XOR exclusively or with the corresponding screen pixels. So that means if there's a black pixel and we try to write white to it, then it will be white. If it's already white and we try to write white to it, it will turn black. Sounds good. And the carry flag, which was that register we talked about before, if you have the kind of special purpose one, it'll be set to one if any screen pixels are flipped from set to unset, right? That sounds cool. And then a beeping sound. So 35 opcodes, good to go. And I think what would be nice is to try to find a bunch of example chip eight programs that are already out there. And so I'm going to go to Google and just search for chip eight programs. And here we go, there's a couple here. And this looks reasonable. So they've got a collection of chip eight, super chip and mega chip eight. Uh, I assume that these are later versions of the chip eight. Uh, we're only going to be building the chip 8 version of this and so hopefully I can find a couple that are just chip 8 Bunch of games And I don't they're all ending with dot ch8 which would lead me to believe these are all chip 8 so it's gonna be interesting to be able to find out how What's chip 8 versus super chip and so on? Cool, oh we can print the IBM logo looks like fun Okay, so I think my first step here is going to be to download a few of these chip8 files and then once I've downloaded a few of these chip8 files uh, I'm going to write a bit of C-sharp code that parses them and perhaps writes out the opcodes I think that would be called a disis... would that count as a disassembler? I'm gonna pretend it does. I'm gonna call it a disassembler. So we're gonna write a chip8 disassembler and then once we're spitting out all the opcodes we can start writing a emulator or a interpreter for those opcodes. So that's how I'm gonna start and we'll see how it goes. Awesome, so through the magic of video editing, I've downloaded a couple of these chip eight things. Uh, what's going on here, just in case you're wondering, is I'm running a browser here in uh, Linux land in a virtual machine, just because I don't want any of my uh, autocomplete stuff filling in while I'm recording video. Uh, I trust everyone out there, except I still just don't want to have some sort of session or something show up there in my autocomplete. And so I'm running Firefox here in a virtual machine, and then I've got a to do list I'll be putting together in here. And my actual development is going to be happening on the Windows host of that virtual machine. So we'll be using Visual Studio and uh, actually running things within Windows here. So that's why it's kind of going back and forth between two different places. And for anyone curious about the music, the music is coming from a no copyright sound stream. And uh, so this is what's kind of playing in the background there. Hopefully not too distracting. I just like to listen to music while I code and thought maybe people would like to listen to it and not just listen to me randomly speaking with nothing in the background. So if you do want to check them out, no copyright sounds, I'll have some attribution in the description of this video. And they're great if you want to do streaming or anything like that and just need some music you can play in the background without getting copyright flagged. They seem to do the trick. So with that all said, let's start doing this. I'm going to just take a look at one of these chip8 files to see what it looks like. So I'm going to use a, uh, I wouldn't call it a text editor, but it views files in hexadecimal and uh, gives a good representation of what's going on there. And so this is what the IBM logo looks like in chip eight code. And let's just take a look to see if this looks about right. So the first code here would be 00E0. And let's see what that would do. If we go into this opcode table and take a look, 00E0 clears the screen. And to me, that seems like a reasonable first step for a program. And so I'm thinking that we're on the right track. This looks like a reasonable chip eight program. And now what we can do is we can go and read these off codes two bytes at a time, since each off code is 16 bits, and just print out what it does. And to do that, I'm going to be writing some C sharp code. So let's give it a shot. I've created a new project here. I've called it chip eight, and I've already gone and dumped a couple of these chip eight files, whatever you want to call them. I uh, chip8 programs into my debug directory and as soon as I compile my code here my executable is going to go in that debug directory and then I can just really easily load these files up and take a look at them and so that'll be my first step uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about what I'm thinking about while I code but sometimes I might just take a silent break to think about things so apologies about that 
Uh, let's start with the IBM logo. Hopefully I'm not breaking any trademark stuff here. Uh, we're just learning about it. I'm not trying to commercialize or make a bunch of money off this video. So hopefully IBM is chill with me doing this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to open it first. So for that, actually, you know what? A stream reader, I'm gonna use a binary reader. And the binary reader is part of the system IO namespace. And I think to do this, I actually need to pass it a stream, which is a bit of a pain. And so, how do I do that again? New file stream? Yeah, that sounds about right. And from there, I can give it a path. So I'm going to toss it that IBM logo, and we're just reading this, and so I'm just gonna open it. Uh, you could, if you were writing to it as well, uh, pass in a different file mode, but we're only interested in reading it. And this just gives the operating system a hint that you're not locking the file for write, and so other things can open it and do things with that file if necessary. So now we've got this in here. I'm going to just start reading all the opcodes in. And the chip 8 format is, what did, so I'm trying to remember my, uh, my words here. I think it's Big Endian, yeah. So Big Endian, and that happens to match what Binary Reader does by default, which is a bonus. I think that there is a way to check to see which orientation or which Endianness the Binary Reader is using, but on Windows and in anywhere that you'll be writing C Sharp code most likely, it will all be reading it in Big Endian, so we don't have to do any fancy reversals of those bytes. So, I think we can just go and read these 16 bits at a time. And to do that, uh, I'm just gonna say my opcode is reader. And I think we can even just read a short, can't we? You went 16, sure that sounds pretty cool. So that's an unsigned short, that's 16 bits. And then we can start to compare this against the opcodes from that Wikipedia table and uh, find out what needs to be done. And just for fun, let's go and print everything out. So. Uh, while my base stream's position is less than the base stream's length. So we're going to operate across the entire file. We're gonna go and get the opcode and then write to the console that opcode. Um, so I think I can now in fancy new C sharp actually place that opcode here. And I think I can even call uh, two string on that and to tell it to output that as hexadecimal. And I can, just, yeah, I'll just do that. And now we should get a list of all the opcodes that are in our file. And just to make sure our program doesn't close on us right at the end, I'm going to go and read a key, clean up that empty line, because that would bug me. And we'll see if this builds and outputs a bunch of opcodes. That looks pretty reasonable. So I've got my first E000 up there and the text size is very small here. I'm gonna see if I can go and bump this up. Cool, I've actually never done that before but that worked exactly as I expected it to work. So E000 looks good and then continue along with 2A2. Now, that actually did not work the way I expected. I expected it to show up as 00E0. Uh, it got read in the correct way, but then the short, yeah, okay. So although the binary reader did read it in Big Indian, the way that a short is converted to hexadecimal, it shows up as the little Indian representation. Isn't that interesting? So really, this is a two string issue and not a reading issue, but how am I going to want to parse this later? I think I'm going to want to do operations on this as if they're little Indian. Okay, so we're actually going to read these in and swap them. So we are going to perform the Indian conversion. So I'm going to go and read a byte in and ship that up by 8 bits. And then I'm going to or that with reader.readbyte so that I get the least significant portion. And this is now going to think it's an int 32, and I would still like this to just be a 16-bit quantity. So I'm gonna cast it back to a unsigned short. And now let's run that. That looks more like it. So really this is 00E0, zero, 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 and it's removing the trailing zeros. And I think if I type X4 there, it will actually print out all four 
of the uh, hex characters, which it did. And so we've got 00E0, A22A, and this is looking more like what showed up in XHD. So this is looking cool. So we can read in all the opcodes, we've got them printed out there, and now we're going to go and convert them to something that makes a little bit more sense for us.